Hello, we're going to be in Matthew 5 today, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. It's the longest extended sermon anywhere in the Gospels. It goes from chapters 5 through 7. We're going to be dealing particularly with chapter 5 today. Now, the Sermon on the Mount has been uh, a great source of blessing and a great controversy. The ideal is so high that men say, well, we can't keep that. I see the Sermon on the Mount somewhat like the Ten Commandments in this sense. The purpose of the Old Testament law was to show man his sinfulness and to bring man to Christ. That's what Galatians, oh, about 19 through 29, Galatians 3, 19 through 29 talks about. The Sermon on the Mount is that passage of Scripture which cuts all of the ground from under the moral unbeliever. For Jesus takes the Old Testament law and raises it to a new intensity and then from the rest of the New Testament fulfills it himself and gives it back to man as a free gift. And yet, although we have won the race by having the righteous of Jesus Christ, God asks us to run the race. And the Sermon on the Mount is an attitude check for the kingdom man. Many people, because of the parallel in Luke chapter 6, think it's the ordination sermon for the twelve apostles, and that may be very true. When I preached on this a few years ago, I called it the psychological profile of a kingdom man. And I think we have to realize that this is not, in a sense, uh, a rule, a set of rules that we are to follow. It is the ultimate kingdom ethic, but it is primarily in the area of attitudes and motives instead of a nitpick and literalism. For Jesus is going to do some of the things he says not to do in this context, like call someone a fool or, or later Paul swear. So we're, it, it's not meant to be taken dogmatically, literally. It's meant to check our attitude toward God, our openness, our willingness to see even the highest ideal and to move toward it. Maybe not ever grasp it, but to move toward it uh, in love. And that, I think, is the context. Now, let's look, if we could. There is an obvious relationship between Matthew 5 and Luke 6. I think it's two eyewitness accounts. Luke 6 is obviously different. It has uh, several beatitudes. Then it has several curses. Uh, it's uh, on the plain instead of on the mountain. Um, and so I think there's some obvious differences. But I think that really uh, gives us a, a, a sense of the genuineness of the eyewitness accounts of the gospel. We must remember that all of these men wrote for a particular group at a particular purpose. Matthew, writing to Jews, records much more about the Jewish law than Luke does writing to Gentiles. And so I think when you see that, there's not a contradiction, but a, a complementary relationship. When he saw the crowds, his motive for teaching was his love for the people. He saw them with sheep without a shepherd, uh, hurt without a physician, and he wanted to minister to them. And so he really kills two birds with one stone. The sermon is given to the disciples, but a larger group heard it. I kind of see it here, if I could put both these together. Jesus was up on the mountain praying all night about choosing the twelve, we learned from Luke. He came down from the mountain because the crowds that had gathered to hear him teach and mostly to have him heal their loved ones and friends and to have some, at least Jewish leader, accept him as being uh, worthy. Uh, he came down to the plain and he ministered the crowd. Then he walked back up on the hill a little bit and sat down in a typical Jewish fashion and began to teach the disciples in, in hearing of the other group. And that's what I think we have here. He went up on the mountain. Now, of course, if you've been to Israel, especially the area of Galilee, there are no mountains there. There are some large, low rolling hills, much like Kansas, but much larger. It'd be the low rolling foothills uh, uh, close to Denver, Colorado, off the, the Rocky Mountains. That's the idea here. And he had taken his seat. Now, this is the idea of an uh, official teaching position. His disciples came up to him, and he opened his mouth. It's another technical word in Judaism for an official teaching. And we use the same idea when we talk about a, a professor's chair, the chair of psychology, or for those in Roman Catholic background, uh, ex cathedra, when the pope speaks officially. That's the same idea as this Jewish word, he opened his mouth and continued to teach them as follows. This is imperfect tense. It's either an inceptive imperfect, which means he began to teach, but I really think there may be something here, the idea that he repeated these same teachings over and over. For the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew are uh, in, scattered out through several chapters in Luke. I really think Jesus used the same teaching illustrations, sometimes in different uh, settings for different purposes, uh, and that's why it's hard sometimes in, in the Gospels to, to run the parallels. Now, 
Blessed. This is the word that means happy. Jesus is really going to tell us what true happiness is. This is very similar to the discussion in the first three chapters of Ecclesiastes, but really it parallels the gos- I mean the uh, Psalms used, like Psalms 1, bless the man who. And there is no verb through here. It's all an, that emphatic, expletive, blessed, happy are you. Now, it's going to seem diametrically paradoxical to what our culture says happiness is. And there may be some real truth in that because, you know, uh, I remember when God said, my ways are high above your ways. Now, God's uh, game plan is so different than man's game plan. God's standard of judging is so different than man's standard of judging. And we see some of that in the paradox. Now, he, Jesus was talking to the poor people. The religious leaders had already begun to reject him and turn away from him. And he knew he was talking to those who didn't have the things of the world, the degrees of the world, the respect of the world. And maybe this is to them. I really think Matthew is the more fuller account because it explains uh, what he's saying. And I think it's a stepping stone of how someone enters the kingdom of God and how they mature in the kingdom of God. Okay? Blessed. Uh, are those who feel poor in spiritual things, are poor in spirit. Now, there's no blessing to being poor. This has been misinterpreted from Luke 6 as saying poverty is a more spiritual condition uh, than wealth. Well, that is not true. We have many wealthy people in the New Testament, Nicodemus, Joseph, Arimathea, the rich young ruler, uh, many other ones who, and who came to Jesus. Now, we have to realize that wealth is not the problem. It's the priority of wealth. It's the love of money is the root of all evil. And so we need to realize that poverty is not a better condition, just like celibacy is not a better condition than marriage. It's the attitude of the heart that's crucial. Now, notice where it says, in spiritual things. Some think this means that we're willing to acknowledge our spiritual bankruptcy. And I think that's the place we all have to begin. There is no good news until the bad news comes. And the bad news is that we're not right with God. And we can't be right with God with any effort that we have. And when we do our very best, we still can't meet the standard of God in Christ. And that's the, that's the requirement. God himself is the standard. That's where the word righteousness or just comes from, a measuring read. And the standard of that measuring is God himself. Now, the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, I, I want to say to you that this uh, spiritual bankruptcy, you may want to see 2 Corinthians 12, 9 for the idea that we don't have any sufficiency without Christ, but in him we have full sufficiency. Now, the word kingdom of heaven here is a characteristic of Matthew. Uh, Mark and Luke use the term the kingdom of God. Now, Mark writing to Romans, Luke writing to Gentiles, was not nervous about the name of God. But Matthew writing to Jews used a circumlocation like... Uh, the heaven or the throne of God instead of saying God himself. The Jews were nervous about using the name of God. So Matthew uses the kingdom of heaven. But they are synonymous as any parallel of the Gospels uh, will show you. Okay? Uh, th- the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Here's the second one. Blessed are those who, who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now this is a strong word for mourning. It's used of grief over someone's death. It's a very strong word, one of the strongest in the Greek language. Those who truly mourn. Now, we're not talking about, I don't think, mourning about uh, anything that we've lost. But this is the ideal of those who sense their own inadequacy, who sense their own sin. When they come to the gospel, not only are they going to be comforted, the idea here is they're going to be fully accepted, they're going to be forgiven, they're going to be brought into the family of God, and that seems to be the meaning of this stair step of spiritual truth you know, in, the, in the Beatitudes. Look at the next one. Blessed are the lowly in mind. This is the word meek. Uh, The word meek was not a popular nor positive word in the Greek language. It was a word that meant uh, sniveling, uh, cowardly, uh, uh, weak. Now, Jesus took this word meek and brought it to a brand new level. It really means domesticated strength. It's used not of breaking an animal's spirit, but of controlling its strength. And that's what the word meek is used of Jesus in Matthew 11, 29. Blessed are the meek, for they shall possess the land the ideal of inherit the land. You might want to see Psalms 37, 11. It's the idea that God's going to put all this right one day and that God's kind of people are lowly-minded people. They don't think more of themselves than they ought. They don't compare themselves with others. They just take the strengths that God gives them and use them in the lives of other people and they repent of their weaknesses in an ongoing uh, way. And so that's the idea here, I think. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst Uh, for being and doing right, for they shall be completely satisfied. Now, this is hunger and thirst. Now, it's hard for us in America to understand that. We've never hungered and thirst for anything. 
But in countries where there is a lack of water, where there is a lack of food, I want to tell you, this is a strong term. It reminds me of Psalms 42, 1. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so does my heart pant after thee, O God. Do you have that longing to know God? That nothing in your life will satisfy the deepest desires of your heart? Not even God's gifts can compare to God himself. Friends, I want you to know Augustine was right. We need God. We can't be satisfied or happy without him. We can put drugs and sex and power and wealth and popularity and everything else in there, but until we find God, our heart will be restless. And when we find we need him, there's going to be a longing for him, a desire that's comparable with the ultimate physical desires of hunger and thirst. Boy, the word satisfied here is the word gorged. It's used of fattening cattle. Now, then it says, verse 7, Blessed are those who show mercy, for they will have mercy shown them. And this is the idea, not that mercy uh, is something that we win God's favor. No. But mercy is a characteristic of those who've been shown mercy. Let me give you a few of the references. Matthew 6, 12. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. Matthew 18, 21 through 25. Luke 6, 38. And Luke James 2, 13. Because we have been touched by the grace of God, we're going to show love, mercy to others. That's the idea here. Now, that's where it mentions, blessed are the pure in heart. Now, the word pure here may speak of motive, purity, single-mindedness, Romans 12, 14. Or it may be the idea of pure coming from the Old Testament background of ceremonial washing. What it's saying is those with a proper motive, a singleness of heart, who are searching from God, will find God. Now, it's not that they'll physically see him but they'll know him, they'll find him, he'll reveal himself to them, is the idea. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called the children of God. Now, peacemakers here, not in the sense of uh, uh, shuttle diplomacy or signing a new uh, uh, anti-aggression pact. The early church said this was used uh, as an internal peace, man finding God. Others have said it's reconciling people to people. That means that once we know God and have brought peace to our own lives, then we can try to bring peace to others by sh telling them God or showing uh, love between men. And some have said it means uh, the ideal of uh, not talkers but doers. <laughs> they don't just talk about peace. They, they apply it in their own life and in the lives of those they come in contact with. I think all of those are valid. Uh, the sons of God is the idea that God's children ought to have the family characteristics of God. Uh, that's why we're to be holy as our Father in heaven is holy. Uh, it is important not only that we accept Christ, but that we become like Christ. A faithful God wants man to respond in faith to become faithful men. And unless you have that whole cycle in there, you miss a very important aspect of Christianity. God didn't just save you because he just likes you. He saved you for a purpose, and that purpose is Christ-like ministry to others. Now, in verse 10 it says, Blessed are those who suffer persecution for being and doing right, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. And this suffer persecution is perfect passive. Uh, they've suffered in the past. They are come into a state of being, of being persecuted. They didn't do it themselves. It's done by an outside agent. Now, this is a very difficult concept for us in modern America because we're not used to suffering at all for anything. But I want to show you a series of scripture passages that talk about that suffering is the norm for the child of God. Persecution is normal for those who really follow Christ. Now, we're not being persecuted because of something we've done that's evil or sinful. We're being persecuted and we're suffering because we are a Christian. Write these down, please. First of all, we have Romans 8:17, Philippians 1, 29, 2 Timothy 3, 12, and 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19. We need to hear that. Suffering is not a sign of God's displeasure. Uh, Hebrews even says that Jesus was perfected by the things that he suffered. Suffering has a place in our life. God is going to make us more like Christ. And you answer me. Does, do the good times or the hard times draw you closer to God? It's obvious. Now, notice where it mentions here. Blessed are you when people abuse you and persecute you and keep on uh, falsely telling all sorts of evil against you for my namesake. Now, here's the idea, number one, uh, telling all sorts of evil. You must realize the early church was maligned terribly for things that she was not involved with. Uh, matter of fact, she was accused of being a, a cannibal because of the Lord's Supper. She was accused of being incestuous because of talking about love for other men. She was accused of being treasonous because she would not uh, fight in the army. 
Uh, and so on and on it went. Many, many uh, accused of being atheistic because they did not have a physical representation of God. Now, all of those false accusations came because they were believers. Now, when it says here, uh, let's see, all sorts of evil for my sake, uh, keep on rejoicing and leaping for ecstasy. These are both present imperatives. This reminds me uh, somewhat of Acts 5.41, where Peter and John rejoice at being beaten to Sanhedrin, and also Acts 16.25, where Paul and Silas at midnight in jail begin to sing praises to God. I want to tell you, the greatest testimony there is is not when things are going well, saying, oh, I love Jesus, but when the roof has caved in, when the dark has come, when the problems surround us so thick we can't seem to see any way out, that's when faith in God has a shining light that the world will notice. This health, wealth, prosperity, good cheer is not a New Testament concept. It's not biblical. It's a modern heresy. Now, notice if you would what it says here, for your reward will be rich in heaven, for this is the way they persecute the prophets who live before you. Godless people have always treated God's men like this. It's a sign of... of it's a sign of being in a, a rare group of God's men when this happens to you. Now, look at verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. And drop down a bit. You are the light of the world. I want to say to you, this is not an option. This is the norm. Christians are the salt of the earth. Christians are the light of the world. The only question is, what kind of salt are you going to be? What kind of light are you going to be? We have no option. People are watching us. We do reflect who God is and what we say and how we live and what we do. That, that's it. You are the salt of the earth. Uh, but if salt loses its strength, you mean it's possible for salt uh, to be uh, corrupted or, 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 or lose its uh, purpose? Yes. Especially salt in this time that came from the Dead Sea, those mixed with other minerals. Uh, moisture or, or time could, could bleed away the salt content, and all you'd have is something else. Uh, they use uh, old salt in this period to put on the roads uh, to make them hard. Uh, there are many, many Christians in our day. Uh, who have not matured into Christ's likeness, who are content with a fire insurance policy instead of a discipleship relationship. And they, they cause great problems uh, for us sharing the gospel in our culture and other cultures. Now, uh, notice where it says here, um, you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. That's talking about God's people now. People do not light a lamp and put it under a peck measure. This is an earthen jar used for keeping dry grain, that kind of thing. But on a lampstand, this was a small protrusion uh, coming out of the plaster walls on which a, a lamp was set, okay? Um, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Look at verse 16. Let your light shine. Aorist imperative. Completed action. Let your light shine before people in such a way they may see your good deeds and praise your Father who's in heaven. They're not going to pat us on the back and say, you're a great person, boy, you're something else. They're going to see God's life in us and thank God for our gift and our ministry and our presence in their midst. It reminds me of Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. I want to say we're saved by grace through faith, but you can't stop there. Verse 10 says, we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, but it was foreordained that we should walk in them. Christ's likeness is the goal of salvation. Friends, I want to tell you, we've got to see the flow. It's not just uh, uh, initial response. Jesus never talked about making a decision. He always talked about making disciples. We ought to hear that. I did a tape on that uh, called Decision versus Discipleship. I think it is the imbalance of evangelical Christi Christianity in our day. Now, notice where it mentions in verse 17 starts Jesus speaking about the Old Testament. And some people accused him of saying, well, you've just changed the Old Testament. He said, oh, no, I have fulfilled it. He affirms here that the Old Testament will never pass away. Even those things that may have been cultural had a place and a purpose and still have some application in our life. All Scripture was given for us. We need to hear that. Now, look what he says. Uh, he mentions, uh, will not be set aside the law of the prophet. This is the two oldest divisions of the Hebrew canon. The Torah and the writings, the Kithbim, uh, and then in between had the prophets. And there we have them, okay? The three divisions. These are the first two. I have come to, not to set them aside, uh, but to fulfill them. Now you might well see 2 Corinthians 5, 1, this thing of taking a tent down. He didn't come to take a tent down, but to strengthen it, to fill it. For I solemnly say to you, heaven and earth will pass away uh, sooner than a dot or an I or a crossing of a T from the law. Now, suddenly this means the smallest letter of the Greek alphabet, 
and the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet, uh, whichever, it's saying the most insignificant part of simply writing will not pass away, much less the eternal truths. And that's the inference here of the eternality uh, of the Old Testament. Uh, then it talks about those who teach that are going to be great, and those who take away are going to be least. Um, but whoever practices them and teaches them, others to do them will be ranked as great in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 20, For I tell you, unless your righteousness far surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven at all. That must have shocked them so badly. They thought the scribes and the Pharisees were the epitome of religion. Jesus says they're the least. He excluded them from being right with God. Now, righteousness here is the word for a standard of measuring read. Uh, the righteousness is God himself, not ritual and not rules. There are some rules. There are some ritual. But it's the attitude of the person. It, it's that lifestyle love for God. It's the beatitudes that work out in daily life. And it's got to go beyond the religious ritual, ritualism of the Pharisees to be approved by God. What a strong statement that legalism is not. Our ritualism is not. Now, they are appropriate in their place. But it's that soft heart towards God that is so important. Read Psalms 51. Now, and we all get caught in that trap of structure versus relationship. You might well see uh, Philippians 3, 8 and 9, Romans 10, 3 and 4. Look at those. Now, notice it says, You have heard that it was said of men of old. Now, Jesus is going to quote some misunderstanding of the scribes and Pharisees. Basically, he's going to attack the oral tradition, which was later codified to the Talmud. Now, what we have here is him affirming the written scripture, appropriately interpreted, but degrading the oral tradition. I want to tell you, many of us are more proud of our traditions than we are of the scripture. Many of us know what the Bible should say before we ever read it. That's the problem here. Now, uh, you, you should not commit murder. And Jesus says, no, I say you shouldn't, shouldn't hate. And he continues, you should not uh, speak evil of your brother. And he goes into a, a, a threefold comparison about that. Now, these verses 22 down through about 22, uh, two, yeah, all of 22, I guess, there's some difficulty in interpreting here. And I'm not 100% sure exactly what it's talking about. Uh, it seems to involve an attitude toward our fellow Christians. Now, it issues in speaking something about him and speaking something at. There seems to be an intensification of these two words. The first one is the Aramaic raka, which means empty-headed, not capable of life. The second one, some think, means fool, but Jesus called the Pharisees fool in, in uh, Matthew 23, 17. I think the word here is not the word mare, which is the Greek word for fool, but the Hebrew word uh, that means apostate or cut off. Now, if that's true, it's saying you who consign others to hell are going to be consigned to hell yourself. Now, that seems to be the Aramaic background of this. Uh, at least to me, it fits the context. Notice that Jesus talks about the, the Gehenna. Now, Gehenna is the term for hell. It meant Ge, valley, Hinnon, the valley to the sons of Hinnon, where Molech was worshipped. The children were sacrificed to that. The Jews hated that. They participated in it. They hated it. It made a garbage dump outside of Jerusalem. And that's what Jesus used for hell. Friends, Jesus is the one that tells us about hell. He's the one that describes the eternal fire. There's only one place outside the words of Jesus that hell is used. That's in the book of James where it says our tongue is set on fire by hell. And so he, he, he is talking about the seriousness of rejecting him. Of attitude is crucial. Uh, notice it mentions here if, if you uh, have your, something against your brother, it's not that the offending party goes, it's the offended party goes. What a beautiful thing here about religion, that attitude's got to be appropriate before a, rig, a, a ritual is significant. Uh, then it talks about uh, be quick to come to terms with your opponent. It's a present imperative. Don't go to court. You work it out between your Christian brothers. That's the idea here. The idea about don't look on a woman with evil desire. It's not adultery that's the problem. It's lust that's the problem. Jesus intensified these Old Testament uh, uh, rules to attitudes. Wow. Uh, divorce is the same idea. Uh, divorce was used by the rabbis, and all of these things are, must be seen in the light of rabbinical uh, abuse of them. Uh, divorce, for, for many, had become just a way of getting another woman whenever they wanted one. It had been totally abused from what even Moses allowed the decree of divorcement back in uh, De uh, Deuteronomy 24. Jesus deals with that. He's going to deal more with that in chapter 19. Uh, the deal about causes her to commit adultery. This is a passive verb. It means that by putting her away, she was considered to be an adulteress. 
And by someone marrying her, they were considered to be marrying an adulteress. So it's the man who puts her away when she's innocent is the idea, is the problem. Now, notice it says here about oaths. You might go back to Deuteronomy 23, 21 through 23. Oaths aren't the problem. It's the fact that we're mostly liars and we have to swear to God that we're telling the truth for someone to believe us. We ought to tell the truth all the time, Jesus said. We ought to be characterized as truth-telling people and not have to swear by... So rabbis would say, now you can swear by heaven and that doesn't count. But if you swear by God's feet, that counts. You see what they were doing? All these little nitpicking rule distinctions. Jesus said, that's, much, that's a bunch of bull. It's a man's heart that's the key. Not these nitpicking rules. Um, let's see. And he continues down here. Look at this, eye for an eye and tooth for tooth. But I say intensifies that. Love your enemies. I, I, boy, what a striking statement. Look at verse uh, 43. That's a quote from Leviticus 19, 18. The Jews said, love your neighbors, which they would say only Jews. And the inference was in their teachings, hate everybody else. Jesus says, no, no. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Do you see the total difference of attitude of this whole section compared to the nitpicking religious leaders of Jesus' day who everybody thought was so righteous and so holy and they thought they were the only ones that were going to make it to heaven. And Jesus says, you'll never make it this way. Friends, we need to reanalyze who we are in Jesus Christ in light of this. The last one is we must be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. None of us can do that except in the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. But as we know Jesus, we ought to walk in him. We ought to walk in the light as he is in the light. We ought to work, uh, walk worthy of the calling where we've been called. We ought to exude the family characteristics of God in our attitudes, in our actions, and we won't be so nitpicking, religious, rule-oriented. We'll be love-oriented. What a difference. I've enjoyed being with you. I'll see you again, same time, same place next week.